everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with my rather good friend, Mr. Ariel Chauvaz. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you ever so much for doing this. Of course. Well, thank you for having me and, and having me a part of this project because uh, anytime I get a chance to work on one of your productions is a dream come true. So thank you. Well, that's very nice. I do share a lot of this work with both David, who's sitting over there, mm -hmm. who had a lot of hand in the production as well. And of course, Michael Wynn, who's in the mix. Yes. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's... It's definitely a vocal centric with acoustic guitar and some electric guitar mm -hmm. um, song. You know, as we were saying off camera, the vocal is. It's is what king. sells the song. What sells the song. But Michael obviously did some phenomenal, you know, um, everybody hates the term EDM, but he did some phenomenal dance stuff to it. Which yeah, I think and the programming is incredible. The sounds, everything, the way it's produced, it's top notch. Which, you know, it's kind of why, you know, I was talking about when I go through the, the, the song is that. You know, this is kind of a less is more approach because it was produced so well that I only had to do certain things that, you know, on other songs, it might take way more effort, way more automation. But when you're given something that's already produced so well, you got to learn to kind of restrain yourself. And uh, hopefully I'll, I can share some of that with you guys. Well, as you may have guessed then, so what RL did is he mixed this song. So obviously it's a mixed competition and there's still a week or two left on the mixed competition. Um, so this is going to be an opportunity for lots of people to watch this and steal some of your ideas. Yes, yeah. Well, and, and if they take it all, they, they might even be able to beat my mix. You, there's no reason you shouldn't, actually. <laughs> so, no, it's, that, that, that's great. That's what, I, that's what I love. I mean, we did that course together, that hip-hop course, and I remember uh -huh. you saying that at one stage in the course. It's like, you know, I'm showing you some of this stuff's pretty easy. I mean, you guys should be able to take this and, and run with it. Yeah. Know? Yeah, Yeah, I, I think so. Well, because we, you know, I'm, I'm going to give away everything in this mix. I'm not holding anything back or Wonderful. keeping anything for myself. So it's, um, I mean, you can recreate my mix identical if you, you know, see what I did. Marvelous. So yeah, it's all for you guys. So without much further ado, let's have you go over there and break down this mix. Awesome. What's up guys? I'm here to do a mix breakdown uh, for the song, I Don't Think We Can Be Friends. And I'm excited to share with you my approach. Um, some of my plugins and techniques and hopefully give you guys some inspiration and ideas maybe you didn't think of and and hopefully help uh, just give you a window into my world and, and how I do things. So when you're mixing a song, if you're starting off with really, really great files, it makes all the difference. And for this track, the way it was produced, the way it was recorded, everything was so clean, it really made it easy for me to just jump right in the mix. I didn't have to do a lot of cleanup work. Um, basically, I just had to, you know, for the mix prep, arrange the files the way I like them arranged and jump right in, which for me is, um, is everything because you can get straight to being creative. You don't have to do, you know, with live stuff, you might be dealing with noise or performance um, issues that you got to kind of correct. But for this song, I was able to jump right in. Um, so let me show you a little bit of what I did. The, the first thing I do is just arrange the session. I, I know it's really basic, but it makes a big difference at the end. Um, and so I arrange my session typically by drums, you know, most important drums, then any effects, the bass, and then instruments. And here I'm going from guitars to the synths, then down the lead vocals and the background vocals. Um, I personally don't use mixed templates. Um, I know a lot of people do, but for me, if I'm using a mixed template, I find that it kind of ties my hands. I end up falling back on certain sounds or using something because it's easy and it's there and not because it's what's right for the song. So typically, I don't have any presets. I don't have any aux buses that I'm loading in. Everything is just going out one and two. You'll notice that this is a pretty minimal uh, session. I'm not doing a lot of routing. You know, sometimes um, you know you get lots of subgroups, but but not in this case. So I'll just start going through and and talking about all this stuff in here. Um, one of the things I did early on is pull in some reference tracks for the song. So basically, you know, I listened to the rough mix um, generally two or three times just so I can hear what I'm missing from the song and, and what I think could take it over the top. 
And then I listen for what, you know, what the song kind of reminds me of or what has, what song has that feeling for, for a reference. And so for this one, I brought in uh, Shape of You. I brought in Sorry, so this is Ed Sheeran, uh, Sorry, Justin Bieber, and then Cold Water, which is um, Justin Bieber and Major Lazer. Basically, Shape of You had a, a warmth that I wanted to capture for this song where the Justin Bieber songs had a brightness and a sheen to them that I really wanted to capture the energy of. And so by having those three references, I was able to kind of bounce back and forth and double check what I'm doing. Um, now, typically, you know, what I'll do is I'll listen to those references, you know, maybe once or twice at the very beginning, again, before I really start the mix. But then I won't check back on them until I'm maybe three quarters of the way through the mix, where I'll just kind of start to double check, oh, am I hitting the mark? Am I too far? What am I missing in my mix that's in these other reference tracks? Um, but again, it's good at the very beginning to listen to them, and then again towards the end. Um, when you're in the middle of the mix, so you kind of want to stay focused on keeping everything, basically focusing on, on what the production is telling you to do, because productions definitely guide mixes. Um, and so if you're just following a reference track, you might not do the song justice. But again, you, you want to have that benchmark. So my recommendation, check in the beginning, check at the end. So the first thing, uh, I start mixing the drums. So everything's muted and I start going through, you know, the kicks and the snares and for this song, um, again, you can see I'm, I'm not doing very much to the kick, uh, which is kind of rare. You know, normally I'm doing a bit of EQing and maybe compression as well as a sidechain compression. On this one, I'm just adding a little bit of a limiter. Um, it's really not doing much. It might not even be hitting it if we actually look at what it's doing. So you can see, I'm not even hitting the limiter. It just brought up the level a little bit. I'm not sure why I did it that way and didn't turn up the track. Um, it's kind of a lesson, uh, you know, when you're mixing, you do a lot of things based on instinct. So maybe I tried limiting it really hard to see how that sounded. And, and I probably ended up just pulling it back till um, the kick was where I wanted it. And again, for this kick, the second kick, I didn't end up EQing or compressing at all. I just left it alone. Uh, you can see that I, I tried a compressor on it that I thought would work and sound good. It ended up, um, oh, this is on the top kick. I tried it. It didn't sound good, so I got rid of it. You know, don't do something just to do it. You know, I, I tried it. It didn't work, so I left it alone. Now for this, this first snare, so I'm pulling out a little bit of the you know, 200 hertz, so some of that, that body, you know, it'll, it'll kind of brighten the sound a little bit. And then, you know, just a little bit of compression. You can see I'm using a, a medium release, so it's not getting too crispy and it's not squashing it too much. Um, and I added a bit of this spring reverb up here. So again, you know, I'm not using any templates um but for this song you know i really like spring reverbs on drums i don't use spring reverbs on very much but for drums it sounds great this is a very simple spring reverb plug-in um i think you know i might have adjusted the reverb time a little bit uh or maybe not it might have just come in the way i liked it and so i'm sending a few things there the snare the clicks the hats and you know, it's it's okay to have different reverbs for different elements of the drums, but typically, you know, my mindset is I want everything that's the same, you know, type of instrument to be in the same space. So I try to always feed anything that's part of the same group to the same reverb. So these drums, I'm sending them all to the same reverb. That way, you know, you're in your mind's ear, you're, you're hearing it as being all in the same space and it kind of glues it together. It makes it feel a little more organic than if you're using a different reverb on each track. The second snare, let's see what I'm doing. So again, a very, you know, subtle, medium amount of compression. Again, a medium release. These might be default settings. Um, the one thing you'll notice is that 
Well, I guess they're not default, so I, I am bringing up the level until I'm getting the amount of compression I want. Um, and I am turning off the analog feature on these. Now, most of you guys probably know the analog feature is just adding a little bit of noise and character uh, back into the signal, but it's strictly noise. And on a song like this, I want it to be extremely clean. Um, a lot of times I will leave the analog if it's you know more live or if it feels like it could have some of that noise in the background, but this track I really want to be super clean. And so you'll notice, I think on all of these, yeah, I'm turning the analog off, I'm turning it off. And again, that's so it stays clean because once I start hitting the limiters on the master bus where it gets mastered, it's going to bring that noise floor up. And if that's what you're going for, cool. But this track, that's not what I was going for. These clicks, it looks like, um, again, just to bring them out a little bit, I'm bringing out some of this 3.4K. That's kind of the presence and a little bit of the bite and attack and, and not much, just so it sticks out a little bit. And that way I can kind of have it pulled back in the mix without it sounding muffled um, or like it doesn't have enough energy. So again, you know, these are pretty small, subtle moves. For this uh, drum loop, it provides the energy going to the hook. And it felt, when I was mixing it, it felt like it just needed a little something. And so this plug-in pressure is a pretty cool, pretty simple plug-in to use. All the one knobs are, they're, um, they sound great. They're easy, I, I recommend them. And as you can see, I'm not adding much, just a little bit of this kind of overdrive compression. So if I just loop, it's getting louder. So I'll try to loop a small section here, but. It's kind of subtle, but if you can hear it, it's adding a little bit of dirt, a little bit of drive, and um, just a little bit of energy, just to make that part kind of come out a little bit more. For the hats. Now this, I'm actually doing some pretty drastic EQing, and it's probably counterintuitive to what most of you guys are doing. I know, you know, when I was first starting out, it definitely made sense. Oh, a hi-hat boosts the high end. A kick boosts the low end. Um, and, you know, as I've progressed through my career, I've kind of realized that's usually the opposite of, of the right call. Um, typically, I'm, I'm trying to go for a full sounding frequency that has just a slight slope down. So that way the higher energies are just, uh, the higher energy um, frequencies are slightly lower than the lower ones. Um, if you guys are familiar with white and pink noise, it's going for kind of a pink noise slope instead of a white noise where it's just even energy across all the frequencies. I'm trying to go for a slight dip in the higher. It's a little more organic on the ears and it sounds more natural and full. And so what I like to do is typically boost the hi-hats because you really want them to punch through, but I end up toning down the high end because they're usually too bright. And on this one, um, again, you can see I'm doing you know, a pretty good size cut at the 8K, a massive cut here um, at the 6K, and then I'm boosting the body of the hats down at, what is that, uh, 500 hertz. Um, so if we go ahead and solo these hats, you can hear there's still, you know, a decent amount of high end going on. And if I get rid of it, you know, it just starts to get kind of crunchy. Um, so this, you know, toning down the high end and bringing out the body, it allows me to turn it up without it feeling like it's becoming piercing or that it starts messing with the S's and the vocals. Um, you really got to find that balance. And again, this isn't something that you can just apply to every hi-hat. You really have to use your ears. And if, if the hi-hat's too dull, you do need to boost the top end. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's, within the context of the song. So it's really about using your ears and seeing what sounds right in the production and the song, but try counterintuitive things. Like on kick drums, a lot of times boosting the top end on the kick around you know, 10 or eight kilohertz can bring the attack 
forward. It can make the, the kick sound more present and actually give you more punch in the mix because it's cutting through more without having to boost the low end. You can actually get it to cut better and have a cleaner low end. So, you know, I just be aware of doing things because it seems like the right thing to do. Um, you just got to trust your ears. So on these two tracks, it looks like I didn't do much at all. Uh, I tried on this one, the MV2, um, which is a cool plug-in. Basically, you know, you're able to boost the, the lower dB frequencies um, or dynamics and then cut as a compressor um, the, the, the dynamics that get too loud. So basically, it's an expander and a compressor built into one. Um, I thought, you know, it was working good on this track, but when I heard it in the mix, it, it wasn't working for me, so I ended up losing it. Which I think brings me to a good point, that when you're mixing, a lot of times it's trial and error. And so, if you have an idea and you think it's cool and you spend all this time dialing in the sound, trying to get it to work, if, if it's not working and you're trying too hard, just get rid of it. Just because you spend all this time on it, don't try to make it fit in the mix or you want to show off you know, something cool that you did. Um, if it's not serving the song, just get rid of it. And it does take, a, I guess, a certain... Um, confidence to know when something needs something and when something doesn't and that kind of comes down to ear training but um, in this case yeah these tracks didn't need anything or much of anything and so I left them as they were. Now I mentioned you know on kicks and snares um, I'll, I'll usually do some kind of parallel compression. On this track I ended up doing a parallel compression on all the drums so basically I'm running all my drums through this drums aux I duplicated that exact aux and I'm adding compression to everything. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of play you this stuff. So this is just the drums, how they are going through the aux. And then here's my kind of squash bus, uh, which I'll turn up for you guys. So you can hear it. it's really crushing it. It's adding some tape noise. Um, I mean, you can see I'm really hitting it as hard as I can. I've turned down the playback. Uh, I've turned up the flux, which adds a lot of kind of, um, I guess, overdrive distortion. And the main thing here that I want to show you guys is the wow and flutter. Basically, that's adding a slight amount of fluctuation to the, the audio signal, so it's kind of wobbling a little bit. Um, that wobble is what gives the drums a little bit of depth. And that's not something I want to do, you know, on the dry signal because I really want the drums to hit hard, but I also want them to have some character and feel like they have some depth. So that's why I really maxed it out here on, on my parallel compression track. And then I really just subtly brought it in. You can see I have it mixed down to, uh, looks like negative 22 dB. I'd say around negative 18 dB is, is a good starting point for when you want something to be subtle but still heard. Negative 22, it's, it's pretty subtle and it's, and it's adding the character, but it's, it's a very subtle amount. So it's not changing the overall sound too much. But it's giving your ear just a little bit of that ear candy. Um, and so here's how it sounds with it all together. See in here, it gives a little bit more depth, a little bit more character, a little bit more drive. And again, it's, it's just because, you know, this is kind of electronic track, everything's really clean. And I'm going for a clean sound, but I still want it to have character and a little bit of grit, and, and that's what this Kramer tape is adding. And we'll move on here to the next group, which are basically the effects. Uh, in this track, they're all sweep effects, um, I believe. A lot of reverse kind of effects and other stuff. And you can see, again, I went very minimal. You know, again, you know, when it's produced electronically, especially nowadays, there's usually EQ and compression um, on the tracks, and the, the 
the sounds are already kind of dialed in. Um, so, you know, again, you have to use your ears to see if it really needs something. And if it doesn't, don't do it just for the sake of doing it. So when I heard these and listened to these down, you know, my mindset going into it is, oh, okay, I don't need to change much, but what can I do to make them a little bit special? You know, what I ended up doing is putting them in their own space um, within the sound field. So basically, you know, if my drums are stereo left and right, and my vocal is going to be in the middle, you know, where can I put these cool effects where they're in their own space? Well, I decided to go outside the speakers a little bit. Um, so I'm running them all through this aux, and I'm pushing the, the width on the S1 imager, which, you know, you can find this guy, you know, in your sound field um, plugins area. And if you have, uh, you know, Waves Bundle, you'll probably have this in there. Um, and you can push the width. And what it does is it takes it from stereo, you can narrow it, or you can actually push it outside the, the normal speaker plane and go kind of beyond the hard left and right. So that's what I've done, where I can have the drums left and right, the effects somewhere out here, and then my vocal will be centered. So that way I get the sound that kind of is almost like a 360 around the listener's ear. Um, and especially for a song like this, you want it, you know, you want people to feel like they're inside the mix as much as possible. Like, not like the mix is playing at them, but like they're inside of it. And so this can be a really cool way of getting stuff outside of where everything else is sitting. Um, but you do got to be careful of how you use it because it can, it can mess with the phase a little bit. And, and that's why it worked really well on these effects because, you know, they're already kind of, um, you know, adding that, that ear candy and there's not a lot of low frequency information. And so I'm not worried about the phasing as much. So if we, if we listen to these guys. You know, pretty standard stuff. You might not be able to hear this unless you have a good stereo system or um, or headphones. But uh, if I just loop this real quick, now soloing it, you might not notice a big difference. But when you're listening to the mix, it really does help you to the ear to hear these instruments without me having to turn them up and have them become too loud. And anytime you can kind of put something in its own space in, in the, you know, the speaker plane, it's going to give your mix more definition, more punch, more clarity, and you won't be fighting other instruments with EQ or compression. Um, so I, I try to put everything in its own space. So that's, that's what I did there. Again, for the bass, <laughs> you can kind of see that I tried a whole bunch of different things here. But I do remember on this one, I tried side chaining it a, a few times. Um, so what I did is off the kick in the hook, um, I set a send, I made it my bass key. You always want to make your keys pre-large fader. So that way, if I change the volume or if I mute this track because I'm printing stems and I'm soloing stuff, um, it won't mute the send going to my key of the compressor on my bass track. So let me kind of show you what I was dealing with here. This bass is, is pretty massive. It's a big 808 sound, and um, I think my first instinct was, you know, to side chain it. Um, so again, I'm not doing it, but just, just so you guys have a reference, uh, let's see where it fits. I think it's this guy. So yeah, I'd set up, set up a bass key. Um, so my key input is from this send, right, obviously. And then I set it in a way that I got a pretty large amount of compression off the kick drum. So basically, it's compressing from the key of the kick. It's not compressing off the sound of the 808 bass. So you can hear it's creating that kind of sucking, typical EDM sound. Uh, I had tried that. I ended up trying, you know, various EQs. I tried multiband compression. I tried filtering. 
Um, and at the end of the day, I could not get it to sound better than when it was just left alone. There was something about allowing that 808 to breathe with the track um, that gave it a roundness, a fullness, uh, an impactfulness. It's, it's one of those things where, again, the production's guiding the mix. Where every time I did something of like that, it felt like I was changing the production and the feel of the song, and I was losing some of the magic. Um, so again, it just kind of proves that if you, you know, if it's not serving the song, don't do something just to do it. Because I, I was convinced I needed to tweak it. It kept feeling, feeling like I was overloading the track. Um, it felt like I was going too loud. But at the end of the day, what really felt the best for the song was just leaving it open. So that's that's what I did with that bass. These other bass tracks, again, you know, after kind of going through all that, um, they really didn't need anything, and so I didn't do anything. Uh, these tracks, you know, are being left alone, and you know, I think bass tracks in particular are something you you really want to be careful about EQing and compressing because anything you do to the low frequencies is going to add a subtle amount of phase shift. Um, even if you're using delay compensation. So for me, there has to be a really big reason to do it. Um, and a lot of times there is, you know, you need to get more bite out of uh, a bass line so it cuts more or, you, or there's too much like woofiness or whatever. You, you know, you have to do a lot of corrective stuff or a lot of creative stuff. But again, in this case, the way it was produced, the sounds were kind of dialed in and I didn't need to do anything. Anything I did just changed the sound of the production and that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to finish the mix, not finish the production. Like the production was perfect. Those are the bass lines. So now going down to the guitars. Again, you'll notice I'm not subgrouping these. I didn't subgroup the 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 bass lines. Um, you know, like I did the drums and this guy's and again it just comes down to what I was hearing for the song. The, the guitar tracks didn't need to be like subgrouped and compressed together. Um, I just wasn't hearing it. So these are all just going out one and two. For this guitar track, you can see I'm boosting just a little bit of the 10K. So I'm giving it a little bit more air. I'm pulling out some of the, I guess, the boxiness, you know, around looks like four or 500, 500 hertz. Um, and then I'm using Saphira if I'm even saying that right, to add a little bit of color and, and harmonics to the track. Uh, Saphira is a very, you know, I guess you can use it in a non-subtle way, but I think it's meant to be used in a very subtle way. Uh, you can see there's the edge harmonics and the warmth harmonics, um, basically even and odd. I won't get into... Um, you know, all the science, I guess, behind that stuff. But the even harmonics, you know, are going to be, you know, your octaves and all that stuff where the odd ones are going to be like the thirds and the fifths. So if you add even harmonics, um, it can be a little bit more, you're, you're basically adding overtones of the octave, which it can get a little harsh because you might get these upper octaves um, that are really bright. Uh, so you want to be careful adding that. And then the warmth, you know, it can start to sound a little too thick if you go too far. So this is a plugin that I'm using just to bring out character um, and a little bit more tone. I guess that's the best way of putting it. Just a little bit more tone where there wouldn't be otherwise. So let's let's listen to this guy down. So without anything. You can hear the EQ just cleans it up a little bit. Um, you know, for an EDM type track or electronic track, where this kind of falls in between, it's kind of a fusion. But you really want to be careful of that, you know, three to 500 hertz. So if it's getting woofy or too muddy sounding, you can clean that up. Um, and then this guy, this is going to be really subtle. You might not be able to hear it on your system. So again, this is one of those really subtle plugins, um, and you kind of have to have a trained ear to use it effectively. Um, 
but you can also use it drastically and, and use it a little more creatively. Uh, but I'd say, you know, a good rule of thumb is if you have something you want to bring out a little bit more character without EQing or compressing, you just, you're missing like something, uh, some emotion maybe or, or something, you know, try this plugin and see what it does for you because it's, it's really cool and it's something that if you spend time working with it, um, you can make your mixes sound more alive, make them sound like they have more depth, you can use them on subgroups, you can use it on you know, your master fader, um, just, you know, try to use it in a subtle way. Like basically push it till you hear it and then pull back till you don't hear it. And that's, that's where it's perfect. Because once you, you mix the whole thing down and it's mastered, it, it makes a big difference in the end. So these other guitars, again, they were kind of processed with everything they needed and I didn't need to do a whole lot. Um, for the bridge guitar, it looks like I tried Let's see what I did here. I tried doing a roll off that took away from the feel. So I got rid of it. Um, I did use, you know, a decent amount of compression and you can kind of get a sense here that the 1176 is typically my go to plugin for compressing. Um, UAD makes a really good one waves. Uh, you know, the CLA versions are really good. Uh, we use it a lot in all the big studios. Um, just because once you spend a lot of time with it, it becomes really intuitive. You know, you can kind of just grab the faders here where it sounds good, you know, for, as far as the attack and release. And it just sounds good on, on just about everything. Vocals, drums, bass, I mean, it's, it's really good. So here you can see I'm going for a slightly faster uh, release, just so I can bring out some of the details in what he was playing. Um, it took me a long time to, to learn and even hear the difference between, you know, different release times. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're trying to bring out more detail in a performance, you, you're going to want a faster release time. If there's little errors or um, you just want it to be smoother, definitely go for a, s a slower release time. And uh, I think I go a little more in depth in, in the course that I have, but you always want to remember that the release and attack times on this guys are backwards from everything else. So the higher the number, the faster the attack release, the lower the number, the slower. Okay, so um, the second thing I did on this guitar was I added this plug in the PS22 spread. Um, this is a really cool plug in if you have a mono track and you want to make it stereo or if you have a stereo track and you want to give it more width or um, just a little bit more of a spatializer uh, type of feel where it's again kind of putting it outside the speaker plane or just pushing it a little bit wider. This was such a cool guitar sound but I wanted to enhance what it was doing in the stereo field. So again, if you're listening on good system, you'll hear, you know, this is a little bit more center. This kind of just pulls it out, which again, gives it more space in the mix without me having to EQ it or turn it up. Uh, it just puts it in its own space, which I think is really, really cool. And then um, one thing you'll notice is these little little edits I did. Um, these are the little squeaks. Now there's, there's a couple ways to approach it. You know, I could have done a de -er where I'm, I just key off those frequencies that are making that noise, but I didn't want to mess up the overall performance and it was just in a couple places. Um, again, I didn't want to remove them because those squeaks on a guitar is what gives it a live feel. And so again, I wasn't trying to get rid of them, but when I did my, um, my little bit of spread here to pull it all outside the speakers, it made that a little bit louder than I wanted. So in those couple little spots, I just edited the audio, pulled it down to where it felt right, where I can still hear it, but it's not overpowering the track. So again, really, really simple stuff um, on there. But this is a really cool plugin to mess with. Um, 
again, if you need to get more stereo information or if you have a mono track and you need it to be stereo, uh, it's a great plugin to use. So moving down um, to our lead here. So you can, you can hear this has already been side chained. Um, it's kind of doing what it needs to do. It's obviously heavily, you know, EQ'd. That's the way the sound is. Um, but what I noticed was quite a few of these synth sounds had a, a ringing in them that really added up, especially when I started pushing, you know, the master bus. Um, and that's something you really want to be careful of when you start pushing stuff harder and harder and, and boosting the high end or top end, you know, somewhere around, you know, 3K can become really harsh, you know, around 5K, um, 2K, you know, you just gotta, you gotta train your ears to hear for it. And, and one simple way of, of, you know, finding these frequencies, if it sounds like there's a ringing or something, you know, is just to create a notch EQ and then sweep for it. So let me just copy this down. Go ahead and make that inactive. So essentially what I did, and this is probably gonna annoy the hell out of you guys, but you know, I boost using this plugin 18 and I use the tightest cue I can and I just sweep. And what you guys will notice uh, set the 1.53. You know, you can kind of go through and just sweep, right? You can hear that ringing start to kind of rise and pitch. And it looks like I just passed it. So when I hit the frequency I'm looking for, you'll hear that ringing, right? There it is. So if I bypass it, it's gone. And so that, that ringing is what I wanted to get rid of. So once I found that exact frequency, um, I just ended up notching it out, right? So you go from this to this, which is basically this sound without the ringing. Right, a really tight EQ. Um, and I believe I did this on a few tracks. So this was, you know, just a corrective EQ. I didn't need to do any like broad stroke EQs. It's already been, you know, high past. Um, it already kind of has the texture it needs. It just needed that bit of corrective EQ. Now this lead here, I believe was a very similar thing where um, I did end up boosting the top end. And I think that that's something to keep in mind for doing like electronic music is, you know, you, you want the synths to cut and be bright. I think it's hard to know when to do it, you know, because I, I, again, I've been some saying you want to be careful and do things counterintuitively, like the hi-hat, I cut all the high stuff out of. On, on these tracks, when I was listening to them, they needed a bit of high-end boost. They needed a bit more air behind them to make them cut through the mix and, and just give them that electronic feel that sounds so good. Um, so I am doing a pretty decent boost up here at 8K. Um, and then I'm doing, I guess, a little bit of creative and some um, corrective EQ on, on this one. So let's hear what it is without it. So basically, it's adding a little bit more air. It's adding a little bit more presence. Um, you know, it's going to cut a little bit more because of what I'm boosting here. But I'm also, you know, again, pulling out, it looks like slightly lower, but again, a ringing frequency where if uh, I go ahead and boost it, you can hear that ringing, which will get in the way of the vocal. It'll make it sound harsh, so you don't want to turn the mix up. And that's really what I want to avoid. I want to sound big, bright, airy, you know, have a ton of low end, but I don't want those frequencies coming through that feel like they can take your head off um, because it can give you a headache. One, it'll just sound piercing and you won't want to turn it up. So again, on these, I'm finding that ringingness and just pulling it out. All of a sudden it opens up the track. Gives me space to mix in uh, things like the vocals. Um, and then it looks like I'm doing 
just a little bit of compression to get the attack down. You can see I'm using a faster release, so I get the detail of the tail. It's just to kind of control those hits. You know, I want, I want the decay to sound nice and full. And that's why I'm using a fast release on this guy. Going down to the pad. So again, I'm doing the, the very similar, if not the same exact boost on the top end. Um, you know, this track obviously is, is a little warmer. It's a warm pad. It sounds like it's been rolled off a little bit. So I'm, I'm trying to bring back some of that air that's missing in there. And again, it's just to add detail, let the, let the ear be able to hear it better um, without adding presence. I'm, I'm mostly just boosting the air on these guys. Uh, this pad, it's probably a very similar thing. Again, it's been rolled off. So there's not much information up here, but again, I'm boosting it to bring out the air that's behind this track. And I think it might be a very similar for all these guys where when I was listening to the instruments as a whole, they were all kind of missing the air. And so I think that's what I did for all these guys was boost everything above 8K for all these tracks. So that's with it without it. Again, so it's kind of that sparkle, the air, um, partly what I kind of call the ear candy, but again, it's, it's creating space for the vocal to sit in because the vocal is going to sit more in that, you know, one to three to five K range. This, you know, we're boosting all that high stuff. So we get more detail out of it without it overpowering the vocal. These guys, same, same exact thing, bringing out the air. And here it just brings a little more forward, gives it a little bit more presence. And same thing again here. So this, this is one of those things where, again, you know, I kind of listened to everything down as a group and individually. And with the way I had everything laid out so far, when I got here, the way to bring these out in the mix was to give them the air. That's where I placed them in the mix. You know, I'm not doing any low end boosts or cuts. It's just bringing out the air behind them so they can really shine. And that's their place to sit in the mix is in that upper air uh, frequency range. So now we come to the vocals. Um, you can see all my vocal effects here. I have Looks like two reverbs uh, and four delays and a parallel compression track. Um, so again, these aren't you know templates or or presets that I pulled in um, that are just like on every session. I listened to the vocal, and I listened to the song, and I started to kind of think, okay, what's going to work well for this? What do I hear for the track? Uh, what's going to sound new and fresh and not sound gimmicky or like I've heard it a million times before. Um, and so this is what I came up with. It's been a year, still it's not clear if we can ever be friends. When every word hangs like a curse over our heads. So, what am I doing? I'm basically rolling off everything below 140 hertz. Now, this is a number I played with a lot. You know, there's a lot of trial and error when it comes to mixing, you know, and I'm trying to get the feeling of the song right. I'm trying to find the, the happy place where everything is just working together and it's hitting right. And, and the song is elevated to something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. You know, that's when you found the mix. Um, and for every song, it's different. You know, sometimes I'll roll off up to like 180. Sometimes I'll even go roll off up to 220 um, if I want a much thinner vocal. If, if I want all the body of the vocal without it hitting the sub, you know, maybe I'll put the roll off point at 80 hertz. So this is something you really got to feel out for each track and, and, you know, try it a couple of different ways or try it and then listen to it in a few areas and see if it's working or how it makes you feel and then adjust accordingly. 140 was 
where I found the, the perfect balance of having the body and the vocal, kind of like the Ed Sheeran track uh, reference, um, where it sounds full, it sounds organic, it doesn't sound over-processed, um, but it wasn't so much low end that it started to not sound right in this track. Because the production with the, the 808 bass, um, and the other electronic elements, you still want it to kind of cut through the mix. And so this gives it a little bit of separation without losing all the body. Then I followed up with, with an EQ. It look, looks like I'm doing a simple boost up at 9K um, to bring out some of the air, some of the clarity. I'm doing you know, a little bit of compression. I'm hitting it once with this, uh, you know, this is the LA-2A emulation. No longer who I was back then, and neither are you. You can see I'm just in the same room. What if we maybe six, seven dB of compression at its peak? I don't think we can be. I don't. So it's it's not compressing it too hard. Um, sometimes you know you, you need to go for a harder compressed track, but these these tracks already had. I don't know if it's compression or leveling, but they definitely had something on them already that I think sounded great. So again, if there's more dynamics in the vocal, you're gonna have to do maybe multiple levels of compression. Um, but for this one, it was already kind of dialed in. So I just, again, was enhancing what I was given. This is a really good point uh, that I like to make um, when it comes to recording your stuff, is basically committing and, and printing EQ and compression to tape. It's something that is done as a standard in, in every big session and big artist that I work with. There will never be a time where I track vocals, where I receive a vocal on a, on a big artist that hasn't been tracked through um, possibly you know a slight amount of EQ, but for sure compression, because we want to control those dynamics. So again, you know, you got to use your ear for this kind of stuff. But if you can hear that the vocal has been controlled a little bit and that it's not just like, you know, the P's and the B's are really loud and everything else is soft or certain words are getting loud and other words are soft, you can see you can get away with less compression. If you're getting something that hasn't been tracked with compression, you're probably going to need two, maybe even three compressors on it. And, and you're going to end up compressing a total of, you know, maybe 12 to 18 dB sometimes I've seen. Uh, on a vocal just to get it to sit right. So this is a really good lesson in, in learning to trust yourself and, and basically dialing in a compression sound that sounds good for whatever you're tracking and committing that to tape when you record. That was obviously done here with the vocals. Um, it was tracked with compression, you know, a really nice amount of compression that sounds great. Uh, the guitars as well, which is why you can see I didn't have to add compression on basically any of these tracks. You know, I did on, on this one bridge guitar uh, just because the dynamics need to be controlled a little bit. But other than that, it's tracked so well, I didn't add any compression there. So again, try to learn to, to you know, print compression to tape when you can. But what I did need to control was the S's. Now, Rather than using a dynamic EQ um, or trying to EQ it out because I didn't want the vocal to become dull, I did something on this track which is really rare for me. Um, I used two de-essers and I used two different de-essers. Um, so you can see what this is doing. I don't think we can be, I don't think we can be friends. It, it's catching the Fs, the Ss. I don't have it set to high frequency only. If I did, it would I don't just be dipping out be. the top end of the vocal. I have it doing, um, basically when the S's hit, it's dipping the entire track because there's information in the fs and the fs um, that I just wanted to dip out everything completely. I hope I'm making sense there. Uh, but then I followed it up with the RDSer that is doing just um, attenuation on the top end when the when it gets a little too loud. So I'm kind of combining the best of both, where I'm doing a full frequency um, 
reduction every time the S's get too loud, and then I'm also doing a reduction in just the high end when the S's get too loud. And so, you know, together. When we said goodbye, it's when the fire you can kind of see this first one is doing most of the work. And this guy is just catching whatever it kind of misses and gets a little bit too harsh. When I hear that song, the beat comes along. And that, that was the biggest thing for me is having the vocal be right up front, have it stay right here, you know, at the front of the song without it taking your head off. And these two DSers was was the way I found to do that the best without the, the vocal getting dull, without it losing energy, um, having it cut through the mix, but not taking your head off. That was a big thing. And then finally, you know, this isn't something you maybe need on the track, um, but I ended up using it, which is X Crackle. Um, I found that there was just a tiny bit of, of uh, little artifacts in, in the vocal. And so I, I put this on just to pull them out. And basically what I can do is um, show you what it's listening for. Now, you can hear those little crackles and stuff. In the audio, it doesn't sound that loud. So you could get away with not using it at all, but I kind of picked up on it, and I wanted to pull it out ever so slightly. So I kind of, you know, hit the difference, tried to listen for what I was hearing. Once I found it, I set the, the threshold and reduction so it's just barely pulling those out. Because again, I don't want to mess with the performance, that's key. Like the performance is the number one thing. So anything that messes with that, I won't do it. So this is a very subtle amount of noise reduction. It just cleans it up a little bit. Um, but again, not affecting the performance too much or the overall sound. And, and then uh, we can look at the effects. So the first thing is, Again, this isn't something I do on, on every track, but it worked really well for this one, and that is um, using parallel compression. So I have my main track that you're hearing that has, you know, the 6 dB of compression that it's adding, uh, and then I'm sending it out to my parallel compression track, which essentially, you know, it's, I ended up rolling off everything below 200. I'm giving it a little low-end boost to give it more body. Um, I'm adding, you know, quite a bit of compression. I'm adding a doubler. Now, I'm keeping the direct signal because I don't want it just to be, you know, the left and right um, doubler uh, um, channels, which are basically delayed slightly, you can see uh, the left one is being delayed 9 milliseconds, the right side is being delayed 23 milliseconds, the left channel is being tuned up by 6 cents, right channel is being tuned down by 6 cents. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with doublers and chorusing and that type of stuff, but, but what it does is it just makes the vocal a little thicker. Um, you're adding, you know, two more channels of the same vocal at slightly different times and at different pitches. So it just makes it sound a little fuller. However, these are below the direct, which is, you know, the, the main original vocal. So this is sort of acting like a doubler, but it's really, in this case, more of a sweetener, um, is what I'd probably call it. And then um, we're boosting. <laughs> I did something kind of interesting here. I'm boosting everything above 7K and then I'm cutting everything above 20K. Um, I think I did that just to control the top end. I really wanted to have a lot of top end without it being really brittle. Um, the information above 20 kilohertz, you're not gonna hear in this recording because of the sample rate and, and how it's being played back. You need to have you know, at least two or three samples per frequency um, in order to hear it when it plays back. This is getting a little, you know, complicated, but if you're following along, you can roll off everything above 20K and it'll actually sound cleaner and clear and you won't get weird um, artificial frequencies because 
you know, a, a sound is going so fast and it's only sampling so often. So I might, you know, sample here, if this is making sense, and then the sound goes up and down two or three times and then it takes another sample here. So it thinks that the sound is just going like this, but really the sound went like this, right? So you're creating false waves within the audio because of the way it's sampling. So the really, really high frequencies, especially when you're boosting as much as I am right here, you might want to attenuate or roll off just so you don't get false waveforms in your mix. I hope that makes sense. Um, if not, you know, we can go into more detail about that another time. But that's what I'm doing. Boosting everything above uh, 10, cutting everything below, or above, sorry, I'm boosting everything above 10, but then cutting everything above 20. And then on the low end, I'm cutting everything below 100 hertz. So this is, you know, basically adding presence. And what we can do is just listen to this by itself. It's been a year, still it's not clear if we can ever be friends. Super compressed, super airy. Uh, it has a lot of detail in that vocal. Um, so when we blend that back with the original, it's basically going to bring energy to the vocal. It's going to bring more of the detail out. Um, I won't have to ride the vocal as much. I, I did hardly any volume rides on the vocal. Um, yeah, I'm kind of showing you everything here. Is I did a slight volume ride in the beginning. I did a slight volume ride in the bridge. But other than that, I didn't have to do too much automating of every word and every syllable because of this, this cool parallel compression, which basically is anything that's not quite loud enough, it's going to pull up right to the level where I tell it to um, because it's getting compressed so hard and it's, it's tucked in underneath. So it's kind of filling in any gaps, it's smoothing out the vocal, it's sweetening it by adding, you know, these little subtle variations in the vocal. Um, and, and for a track like this, you really want the vocal to sound special, unique. You want it to kind of jump out of the speakers. And that's how I achieved that. For reverb, I'm using the IR-1, you know, I think it's just a hall reverb. Um, I think I might have messed with the reverb time. I'm using the Imager again, which we talked about earlier, just to push the reverb a little bit outside of the speakers, a little bit wider than normal. Um, I think it's really cool to play with reverbs, you know, like the space they fall into. So sometimes, you know, you might twist the sound a little one way or the other. Um, maybe you even pull the reverb more center. Uh, but typically, I tend to go wider so the, the reverb kind of comes outside around your head a little bit. Um, and I always, I always do some kind of drastic EQ on reverbs. So on this one, I'm rolling off everything below 200 hertz. It keeps the reverb really clean sounding. Um, it lets it kind of float in the mix without taking up too much space or adding any mud. And it kind of adds you, it allows you to add more reverb than you normally would when you roll off all that low stuff. Um, I'm using the ping pong delay here with, you know, the lo-fi setting. I have the analog turned off because analog on H delay, uh, I think it's, it defaults at number two, which is really loud. So if you do any limiting on the master bus, that's going to get loud fast. So I always recommend turning that off. Um, again, I'm doing some EQing of the, of the high and low pass filters. Uh, and then I'm feeding that delay back into my reverb. So I'm sending from my vocal to my reverb, I'm sending from my vocal to the ping pong, and then the ping pong is feeding that reverb again. So what is that doing? It's kind of, again, that same concept I talked about earlier of trying to put things in the same space so it sounds natural to your ear. So by having the, the delays feed into the reverb that my vocal is also feeding into, creates this organic, space that everything is sitting in as if, you know, you, you went and tracked it all together in, in some magical place. It looks like I tried a couple other delays. I think, you know, some half note delays that I thought might sound cool, but started to sound, I, I believe, a little gimmicky, which I, I wanted to avoid. Um, and part of the reason for that, uh, just so you know, my mindset going into it is, again, looking at the production and what was done. When you guys got these files, I'm sure you saw there was 
this vocal delay track where the delay throws were already printed. You won't always get those, but when I get a track that's specifically vocal delay throws, I know they were done deliberately. I know they were done on purpose. So I'm going to be very hesitant to add my own delays and delay throws into the mix um, unless there's a really good reason for it. Otherwise, I'm again, I'm kind of changing the production um, and changing the feel of the song. And in this case, he already had these really great delay throws in the exact places that they heard them and wanted them. So I didn't want to do, you know, these kind of half note delays, either blanket across the whole vocal or doing my own here and there. So I, I tried it. It didn't quite work. I got rid of it. Now, the one delay throw I did add um, is right here in the song. Let me, let me play it down for you guys. But it's better to stay just as we are and let it all fade. I don't think we can be, I don't think... Now, the reason I did it um, is a couple reasons. One, it kind of felt right, you know, at this particular place in the song. And, and two, the lyrical content. Um, you know, I try to find a synergy be between the lyrics and the mix. Um, and I was kind of talking about this, uh, you know, with the artist and, and, and with Warren, um, that when I approached this mix, it, it had kind of a depressing, you know, like the lyrics are a little bit depressing. Um, it's kind of a sad song if you really think about it. And so I went a little bit warmer with the mix and, and ended up going brighter once, once I, uh, you know, started living with the mix and, and trying to figure out, if, you know, what was working. Um, but I try to find that synergy between the mix and the lyrics. And this is one place where it really worked well. So he's saying, let it all fade. you know, let it all fade. So how can I actually create that in the mix? Um, and, you know, doing a cool delay throw that kind of reverbs out and, and filters out into, you know, the ethers is a really cool way of letting it all fade. And this is a cool way of doing delay throws, which you guys might know about. A lot of people do it, you know, Justin Bieber and, and uh, Post Malone. Um, these kind of artists, they tend to do their delay throws like this. And, and it's because of uh, Goodwin, a good friend of mine who engineers and mixes for them. This is how he does all of his delay throws. Basically, he'll copy the vocal down to another track move it over, you know, the amount that, that he's looking for, and then process that track as the delay throw. So as you can see, I copied the vocal down, I moved it over um, a half note, and then I was able to process this. So what did I do? I'm using a high pass and a low pass to kind of create that telephone effect, and it also puts it in its own space, um, separate from the vocal. I'm using Futzbox. Again, to add character, add a little bit of a filtered sound, a little bit of distortion. Again, just putting it in its own space. Um, and then I'm sending it to a, to a reverb, which isn't 100% wet. You can see I'm 30% I'm wet approximately. So there's still a lot of dry signal coming through. Um, but that kind of adds, again, more space to the sound. And then I'm feeding that into... Uh, a delay, which is a simple quarter note delay um, with a good amount of feedback, you can see. So, again, what's cool about this is it really allows you to detail in whatever you hear for the delay throw and even automate stuff. So, um, I could automate the feedback time. I could I could automate the reverb amount or the high pass filters and have a lot more control and just create a, a much more unique um, delay throw. I could even uh, uh, you know, edit this vocal in a way that the delay throw is slightly different from the original. I could add a stutter in there. You just have a lot more control than simply using a send off the aux or the track itself. So I think th this is something cool to experiment with if you haven't already. Um, again, and, and you can create some, some pretty cool stuff. But it's better to stay just as we are and let it all fade. I don't think we can be... Okay, so the last thing uh, that I want to show you guys is the vocoder parts. So this was pretty, again, pretty straightforward if you're listening to it. 
All right, sounds cool. Um, it has some stereo width to it. And you can hear there's multiple voices happening. And so my main concern was all the S's lining up. Um, Cause we have the lead vocal that that's singing the S's. We have a left and right double that's underneath the vocal that's doing S's. And then now we have all these other voices adding S's in stereo. And so for me personally, I like, you know, when the vocal has focus and, and the way a lead vocal has focus is by having the S's right up the middle. If you start getting S's that are all slightly different timing, kind of like pulling one way or the other, the vocal starts to kind of lose its focus. It sounds a little wishy-washy. Um, and you start losing some of the impact of the song, right? And we want to keep the emotion of the song. So first thing I did was DS this pretty, pretty strong. You can see it's taken off about 6 dB off the S's. And so in the mix, you know, again, it's it's allowing the lead S to kind of lead. I don't want these to sound dull, so I'm not EQing it out uh, necessarily. Um, I'm just pulling it out when it needs to be pulled. Uh, and that's whenever these, you know, frequencies above the 7K range get too loud and I'm pulling it down. Now, this is something I'm, I'm really excited to show you guys because I'm not sure how many people are familiar um, with this plugin or this mode, but it's pretty cool. Um, the Chef 73 has a mode on it over here. You can see the modes. There's stereo, stereo, duo, and MS. MS stands for middle side. And basically, normally this is, you know, the left channel and the right channel, and they'll be linked. Um, but in this case, when when you s separate it to middle side, the left side becomes the middle and the right side becomes the sides, meaning you can EQ the sides of a stereo image separate from the middle. Um, and I hope I'm making sense. I'm not really good at explaining myself sometimes, but essentially, like I was just talking about, the, the S's when they're in stereo starting to pull isn't, doesn't sound very good. So by going middle side, I can EQ out the top end off just the sides and leave the middle exactly where it is. So basically I'm turning down the top end on the sides of the stereo track and everything that's the, in the middle as far as these high frequencies are being left alone. Um, you can get really experimental with this where you know, you're boosting the sides and cutting the middle of certain frequencies. Um, it's kind of cool to use if you have stereo drums that are printed all together. Uh, and let's say you want to get more bass out of the kick, but you don't want you know the, the bass to get too loud on any stereo stuff like the overheads. You can do this middle side technique and boost just the middle low frequencies and not the side mid, uh, low frequencies and get some really cool sounds. So Check that out if you have this plugin. There's other plugins that have middle side, so just you know, open up the manual where this little question mark is. Check out the plugin, see if it has it. I know a lot of newer ones do, and and start experimenting with that and seeing how you can use it to your advantage in your mixes. Once I made it to the end, you know, it, it really comes down to just fine tuning, hearing the mix over and over again, maybe playing in in different spaces where you haven't heard it before, and doing what's best to serve the song. You know, I'm never trying to do what something that makes me look good. Um, I'm trying to do whatever makes the song sound the best. And so, again, in this case, you know, I approached it a little bit differently than I would something that's more live um, or something that's, you know, more hip hop. You know, this, this has its own feel and its own vibe and you got to figure out where that magic place is. And so having references to kind of help guide you will be really helpful. Um, and just taking your time and, and, and learning to listen, you know, kind of with emotion and not with such a technical uh, mindset. Um, you know, one thing that I did early on that, that I was talking to Warren about is uh, we would tape up the meters in the studio 
and, and do mixes. And when we were finished, we would pull off the meters just to see where everything was at. And it was one of those things where had we been looking with our eyes when we were mixing, we wouldn't have mixed it the same way because technically it would have been wrong or it would have seemed like we're taking something too far. And it just shows that you need to learn to trust your ears and you need to do ear training and do what sounds right. So if it seems like something shouldn't be done because you've been told you don't do things that way, but when you listen to it in the song, it makes you feel all good, then keep it and use it. So I, I can't you know, emphasize that enough. Do what feels right um, and do what makes the song feel the best. Thank you ever so much. Of course, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, please, if you haven't already, download the tracks. I think there's still another week or so left on this song. You can mix it. You can take all of Ariel's ideas. You can put in your own ones, whatever. It's just, you know what, to be honest, it is rather wonderful for me that I get to hand off mixing and I didn't have to do it. Yes. <laughs> Shh. And that I got to do it. I mean, when producers steal the mix engineer's job, that's when we're all in trouble. Yeah, no, I, it's it was good. And I think, I, I love this idea, and we're gonna we're gonna master this with Warren Sokol, and hopefully Warren. Yeah, that's gonna be great. We'll do a video with him as well, because it's to me the whole idea of doing this was to show pure collaboration. Now, mm -hmm. luckily, Michael was here with David and myself when we did the first vocal acoustic tracking, mm -hmm. um, but the rest of it was done with us being in Los Angeles and him being in uh, in the Highlands of Scotland, just outside Inverness. Yeah, um, and that, that's one of the great things about the age we live in is you can actually be across the world. Yep. And do stuff like that. It's yeah. incredible. And actually, I mean, a lot of the mixing I do is, I mean, I want to say 70% of the mixing I do is all remote. Because the artists are traveling, touring, you know, off doing what they do. And they can send me the tracks and I can send it back. It, it's a really beautiful thing. And uh, it's really cool that you produce the track this way. Yeah, it was wonderful. Well, Michael is incredibly talented. And so, of course, is young David sitting over there. Thanks ever so much. Of course. Thank you. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below and have a marvelous time mixing this. And uh, good luck to all of you. Good luck. And we'll speak to you all again soon.